Greetings, my fellow Americans. Today we're going to talk on the subject of federal court censorship in Montana. This is a big issue, and it deals with a lot of things beyond Montana, but it's something you really need to listen to because it's how your rights can be restricted regardless of where you are. So if you think this might be important to you, please pay attention. Now, traditionally in the United States, whether it be in Alabama or Montana or California, it doesn't matter. The individual states have the right to be overlooked and overseen and governed by the federal government. There's the 11th Amendment that has the allowance that says that there's a separation of a sovereignty of the states where the federal government cannot come in and rule the state territories, although, yet again, that is something that the federal government routinely ignores. But it also says, it goes to say that the federal government does have the right to come in and enforce civil rights violations or actions by actors within the states that actually violate federal standards. In this case, most cases that are brought under these circumstances are either under 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, which is civil rights violations, and the right to sue state actors for those civil rights violations, or also under 18 U.S.C. Section 1961, which is RICO, which stands for Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organization Act. This is both a civil and criminal component to this. The RICO law actually allows federal government to come in and actually penalize any actors who are violating a whole sequence of crimes, including civil liberty violations, but a whole host of other things and wrongful acts that occur in a progressive chain of, well, organized crime, basically. If you have a government that does it or a private company or individual who does it, RICO is a strong and powerful tool to come in and enforce the rights of the citizens. Unfortunately, when it comes to Montana, no one oversees Montana. Why? Because, as I have said in previous videos, every single appointed position within the state of Montana that I have been able to locate who holds a federal office has been elevated from a state position, which means they already have a pre-existing bias and prejudice towards the institution and the criminal misconduct of Montana. You don't have someone from Louisiana coming up and looking at Montana going, oh my gosh, we got to do something because the rest of the country is kept out. Montana does Montana. You have that expression, What's, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, consider this to be Montana's version of that. What crimes happen here, we are the only ones who see them. And of course, the, the system as it is covers them up, especially when the actors are either well-to-do or government entities that, or, or personages themselves. Now, Interestingly enough, <clears throat> in Montana, they take a federal law, which is uh, 28 U.S.C. section 1915 and 1915A, which were established by something called the Prison Litigation Reform Act, which, don't even get me started on that one. In 1996, the Congress, a very Republican-leaning Congress, decided they wanted to pass laws to shackle prisoners even more than they already were. They wanted to write, they wrote two very offensive laws that year and passed them. Ironically enough, Clinton was actually the president at the time and he signed these into law even though they're wholly, wholly offensive against any rights of, of inmates. But basically the, the, the public idea at the time was that inmates or prisoners, whichever you want to call them, who had an abundance of time on their hand, hands were flooding the courts with frivolous motions. My soup was too cold, and I'm suing my the, the state. I'm my, I woke up and my feet were cold. You know, just frivolous, ridiculous little things. And, and there certainly were. We didn't have chocolate cake with lunch. Was an actual lawsuit brought against a prison system. I think it was back east somewhere. But yeah, there, there was, and I don't fault this, there was a whole host of people who were just sitting back and just throwing off petition after petition after petition after petition to the federal courts, trying to just get attention because they could. Most of these were frivolous. Most of these were nonsense. But there were some legitimate claims. There were some, and there always are. You know, you have to be able to, to separate the the wheat from the, from the chaff, you know. You have to be able to say, okay, what's good and what's not. And I can't fault the federal government necessarily for seeing this and trying to find a remedy. And their remedy was the Prison Litigation Act 
1996, as well as, despite the title, the <clears throat> it was called the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, both of which included language which greatly infringed upon the civil liberties of inmates and actually restricted millions of people's constitutional First Amendment rights to access to court. Sweeping, unmistakable. But what we have here is a situation where, with the Prison Litigation Reform Act, it, started, it, it instituted some policies. And the policies were that for, if an inmate brings a claim against a government entity, the federal court has a right to, or an obligation, actually, to review that litigation to determine whether it's frivolous. Not to make a, a legal claim or defense of the state, not to come in as a third party, and not to just you know find legal reasons to deny the claim, to determine if it's frivolous. That was the purpose. That was the intent behind the law. The law said that basically, if you're going to be filing nothing but frivolous lawsuits, we're going to stop you. And we're going to prevent you from wasting the court's time by doing this. Of course, in practice, it came out quite a bit different. In practice, the courts took this as a leave that they could come in here and not only make a judgment of whether it's frivolous or not, but actually rule on the claims before any other party made a response. The process under this law is that inmates have to file their action with the court in advance before serving the other party, allow the, the court to screen it, and then only if the court approves it can they proceed to preserve the defendants. Now, in a normal action, if you're not aware, you have to, you file it first, you serve the defendants at the same time that you're filing it. So you're actually filing a, a proof of service with the court that says you've actually served the defendants or had them served or that you're in the process of serving them. Or in the case of a complaint, like if you're filing a complaint against someone, you go to court, file the action, get summons, and then serve the defendants. But either way, in a normal process of litigation, whether it be civil or criminal or whatever, there's a process. And that process does not involve the court coming in as a third party and making a defense, or in this case, an opposition against the litigant. That's precisely what this law allowed. Now, again, the intent behind it was different than the application. The intent was for the court only to come in and screen and determine whether or not the action was frivolous. Is this guy just complaining about cake not being served at lunch? That's frivolous. Is this guy complaining about a toe, toenail inf infection that the, that the prison will not treat? That's not frivolous. But in the process of, of allowing them to come in on this, it gave the courts the ability to go beyond the scope of the law in practice, and start looking at the actual meat and bones of the case. So if I bring a, if I were an inmate and I brought a claim of, you know, stale cake at lunch, the court would have the right to come in under this law and say, that sounds pretty frivolous. There's no actual wrong done to you, no harm done to you, and it certainly isn't a violation of any civil right. What it doesn't have the right to do is to come in and say, provide legal argument against why this is why this claim is, is not valid. Well, in Jones v. Espringer in 1922, it was decided that a prison inmate did not get to choose his dietary measures. And therefore, we're going to and start talking about what rights and, and privileges in it is someone had to bring such a claim. It goes way and beyond the right of at, for access to court. You have the right under the First Amendment to bring a claim against the court. Or you have the right to not only bring a claim against the court, you have the right to bring a claim against or to, to, to petition the government for redress. Actually, to be more specific, the First Amendment says, and I'll read it verbatim, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, that last part, of course, is what we're talking about, to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Congress shall make no law restricting this. They may make no law respecting the right to petition the government. The Congress is prohibited by the U.S. Constitution to have even passed or even considered creating this law.
the Prison Relegation Reform Act of 1986 was unconstitu 1996, sorry, was unconstitutional because the Congress was forbidden to make the law. Not only was it made, but it's been upheld. It's been maintained. It's the law of the land. It's been the law of the land since 1996. Because, why? Well, I don't know. It just, the, the courts do not see this as a problem because the courts don't want to be wait, have their time wasted. And you're asking technically the courts who are technically a party to this action, if you will, they are, they are in an interested party. They have a conflict of interest. They don't want to have their time taken up by all these frivolous claims. And I can understand that. But just because they don't want to do their job doesn't mean they should be allowed to endorse a law that says they don't have to do their jobs. The Article 1, Section 9... Clause 2, it talks about the privilege of writ of habeas corpus. It says, it says that the writ of habeas corpus should not be suspended unless in cases of rebellion or invasion as the public safety may require it. Yet in spite of this, in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of the same year, the Congress said, well, we're going to restrict the right of federal habeas corpus. State inmates may not pursue, pursue or no one can pursue um, a federal habeas corpus, unless a certain criteria are met, and you can't pursue it a year after your conviction, after your conviction, after you've been locked up. If your state actions resolve, you have one year to bring a claim in federal court for federal habeas corpus, and if you don't, you lose the right altogether. Additionally, you can't bring a second or subsequent habeas corpus. You have one shot. Does that sound like not infringing upon the, the right of habeas corpus? Of course not. But we're dealing with this Congress, this very Republican Congress, and I don't say that to be a political person. And, and I need to re-emphasize re-emph this in the past. I'm not a political person. I do not subscribe to party politics. In fact, I believe that the political system should be outlawed. It should. There's just no, there's no reason for it to exist other than to polarize our country and to take loyalty away from the citizens who these people who are elected are, are to do. If you elect a person by popular vote to a position, they don't then stop working for the people who elected them and start working for their party. That's an outside loyalty, an outside affiliation that clearly and repeatedly infringes upon fair and just governing. Okay, I said my piece on that. But when you have a Republican conservative-leaning Congress, traditionally they believe in less government and more freedom of enterprise. They want the individuals to have power and the government to have less. Or in this, and, and also, they tend to allow for restrictions that inhibit poor and underprivileged a lot more than they do the rich and wealthy. Just, it is. These laws didn't affect, you know, Bill Gates. They didn't affect Martha Stewart. They didn't affect any of the wealthy or elite people who might face a legal challenge somewhere along the lines. They don't. Because those people have money, they have lawyers, they have all this abundance of information. These laws do not restrict them in any manner, shape, or form. They affect the poor, they affect the indigent. This aspect of law, and the reason why I'm bringing this all up, is because this federal law, Section 1915, or 28 U.S.C. Section 1915, gave the courts the ability to control the flow of complaints that were coming in. 1915A specifically, it, it said it denied equal access to the court to the millions of people across the country who are incarcerated in one form or another. And specifically, and this is important, the definition of prisoner under the law reads, any person incarcerated or detained in any facility who is accused of, convicted of, sentenced for, or adjudicated delinquent for violations of criminal law or the terms and conditions of parole, probation, pre-trial pre release, or divisionary program. Only an individual in a facility qualifies under Section 1915A, and their action has to be against a government entity. However, Montana has taken it one step further. Under Section 1915, which doesn't 
say anything about what they say it says, but they, they quote it constantly. They claim they have the obligation, not only, not only the obligation, really, the, the mandatory commitment to pre-screen any, any complaint brought in form of papyrus, which, for those who don't understand what in form of papyrus means, it means in you're basically filing as a poor litigant. In a, in the form of papyrus, in the form of being poor. Sometimes it's called a waiver of fees, but the federal term calls it in form of papyrus using the Latin expression. And what it does is the Montana courts say, because you are poor and because you can't afford the court filing fees, we're going to extend this law to say we get to we get to pre-screen your actions. Anything. If you if you don't can't if you can't afford the two hundred some odd dollars to file this action because you're working a minimum wage job, you are on disability, you're retired, whatever. If you can't afford the two hundred, three hundred dollars some odd fee to file this action, we get to decide if you even need to bring it. And that is what they do constantly. They come in as a third party. Remember what I said earlier? Even 1915A says the court's only supposed to go in as far as to judge whether it's a frivolous claim or not, not to bring legal argument against the claim itself or to defend the other party. This is what Montana does. Montana comes in and says, under Section 1915, we, we pre-screen this, this, this complaint, and then they find reasons to shoot it down, even if they have to change the language of the complaint itself to justify a denial. I brought an action against... Angela Townsend for stealing a trademark of mine a few years ago. Federal court brought this brought it under a federal trademark act. Clear violation of trademark. She used my title that I created for her book. Plain and simple. Called The Forlorn. That was my title. I created it. She knew I created it. We had conversations back and forth by email. I filed a petition in federal court. Judge Jeremiah Lynch, who's a magistrate judge, by the way, not even a, a full-pointed uh, federal judge, a magistrate judge, decided to change the details of my complaint to justify dismissal. Now, in that action, there was no action against a federal government agency. I was not an, a prisoner under the definition of the law. I was not incarcerated in a facility. Yes, I'm a political prisoner, and then I am detained within the state of Montana, but I'm not in a facility. Therefore, I did not meet the measure of the law of definition of prisoner, so even the 1915A clause didn't apply to me. But even if it had applied to me, I wasn't bringing an action against a government entity. I was bringing an individual against a, a claim against a private person. So as you can see, they reach be well beyond what the law is. And they sit here and they say that they claim it exists. It doesn't. I've read the law extensively. It does not, it does not exist. The law they claim exists does not exist. They claim it does. It doesn't. Read the law. Go ahead. Look it up. 28 U.S.C. section 1915. 1915. Look it up. There is absolutely nothing in there that says that a court must review any in form of pauperous claims to determine whether the claim is valid or frivolous. Nothing. The only language that exists in is in section 1915A against prisoners who are bringing claims against government. This is how the federal courts in Montana censor claims against government and against anybody who's better off than the poor. They deliberately disenfranchise the poor. Deliberately. This process subjects anyone who is poor or disenfranchised to a denial of due process. You'd have no right of access to court. It's a sham. You can file it, but you can't do anything beyond that, or does the court will block you? The court will come in and defend your the person you're up against. They will become a third party in the action. They're no longer an impartial arbitrator, which is what the courts are supposed to be. They're supposed to come in and impartially adjudicate two claims brought before them, whether it be criminal or civil. That's their job. That's why judges are not supposed to be politically aligned. But we know we still have conservative and moderate judges. or sorry, conservative and liberal judges. You have people who lean politically, and they're not supposed to. We already know this, but they aren't Republicans, and they aren't Democrats. 
because they can't run as a Republican, they can't, or they, and they can't be appointed as, as a Democrat. They can't. They can't. It's prohibited. They are not supposed to be party affiliated, and yet they are ideologically. So what you have here is a situation to where the courts in Montana who don't want the state to be put under, under scrutiny. You don't want poor people to rise up and make claims or become empowered. And so the courts sit back and they decide to basically find reasons and excuses to dismiss and come in as litigants themselves in this action and defend the defendants in the case. They bring up the they make up the legal strategies, they make up the legal do the legal research, and they do all the work for the other party. You not only fight when you when you file as a as a as an indigent litigant in Montana in federal court, you're not against who you are fighting against. If I file, let's bring Jim Bob back. We had brought him in for this episode. Uh, if you if I'm filing an action against Jim Bob in the federal court, I'm not facing Jim Bob. I'm facing the court. I'm suing Jim Bob, but I'm arguing against the court because the court comes in and makes a decision and makes and finds all these reasons not to allow this case and defends Jim Bob's claim about Jim Bob ever having to take a step or to make an appearance in court. There's no equal access. There's no fair arbitration. There's nothing. It's a completely prejudiced system. I don't care if you have your rights 100% on your side. The federal courts of Montana will shoot you down if you're poor. They will find an excuse not to allow your action to proceed. I had an action several years ago. I was helping somebody while I was in prison. He had a rock-solid case. I mean, rock-solid. You, you can't get more solid than this. He, As a minor, he had been put in prison for a crime. And he, the state Supreme Court had said, nope, you have... It was a, it was a uh, unlawful detention because you were incarcerated as an adult when you were a minor. Therefore, it was unconstitutional. We hereby order you released. And he went on probation. Well, then he turned around and violated probation and ended up in prison, which is where I met him. But he was still within, within his time to pursue a claim for, for a wrongful arrest, a wrongful detention. Black and white, the state Supreme Court had already said you were wrongfully detained. There's no dispute that his claim was valid. No dispute whatsoever. But once again, Judge Jeremiah Lynch, Mr. Magistrate Judge, decided that he didn't have a right to bring a claim. In fact, his exact language was, sometimes your only right for wrongful incarceration is to be released. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. Your only right, your only thing you can, re can gain from wrongful detention is to be released. You don't get to sue for lost wages. You don't get to sue for emotional duress. You don't get to sue for the fact that this scarred you. Honestly, let's be let's be fair here. You put a minor, a 17-year-old, into prison, and he has to wait a year and a half to get before the state Supreme Court to get him to order him to get released. You don't think that scars him? You don't think that makes him more likely to commit crimes? So when he gets released, surprise, surprise, he gets violated and goes back to prison as an adult this time. There, there, there's a huge argument there for whether he would ever have had that secondary violation as an adult if he hadn't already been subjected to the, to the wrongful arrest to begin with. There's a whole host of claims that are made, can be made against the Montana state government for that. But according to the federal courts in Montana, his only right was to be released. And once again, it was pre-screened. The state never had to respond or defend itself because the federal court in Missoula, Montana, defended the state. They came in as their attorney. They were not a partial. They were not, they were not, they were, it was an arbitrary act. It's a measured and bias, it's measured bias and prejudice against pro se and impoverished parties. It's unconstitutional, it's arbitrary, and nothing in law allows for this process. In, in uh, I'm trying my hard not to mention this person's name, but in this case I just cited, yeah, pre-screening existed because 1958 kicked in. He was, a, he was a prisoner, and he was bringing an action against a state actor. Okay, 
So Section 1915A was applicable in this situation. However, the court only uses it as a reason to block the claim. And it was a clear claim. There's no argument. But because he was pro se, did not have an attorney, the court determined that he didn't have any rights. Your only right is to be released. So after a year and a half, sorry you lost your life for a year and a half, sorry you spent your 18th birthday in prison, but you're, you, you get to be free now, and that's just be grateful and, and move on with your life. He didn't get to graduate high school. He didn't get to go to his prom. He didn't get to marry his childhood sweetheart. He didn't get to have a life. He didn't get to do the to transition that a normal teenager gets to go into, into being an adult. He doesn't. He just doesn't. So what happens? What rights do you have? Apparently none, according to, to Montana, but the law laws are all different. And I'm sure if you, you can do a host of searching... By the way, I'm sorry, I've got my cat over here trying to get into the, into, the, into the frame. So if you see her tail or you see me pushing it away, I'm trying to keep her from, like, coming over and getting in here. <laughs> but she's just wanting attention right now. And, and I apologize if she does somehow come in and block the screen at some point. I have two cats, by the way, if anyone's interested. I have Felicia, who's my pretty little black and white here. Since we're talking about her, let me bring her up here. Here she is. Here's Felicia. There's my little girl, okay? This is the one who's trying to get attention right now. I also have Wade. He's much bigger. He's, he's a boy. Um, and he will also come in here and try to get attention from time to time. So please forgive if that does happen now or in the future. But anyway, back to the subject here. When you have a situation where you have a court that says, we get to come in here as a party and, and, and argue against you. We get to do legal research. We get to find reasons to disclaim. And they, aren't, they are no longer an arbitrary, they're no longer an impartial party. They're not coming in to impartially administrate justice. They're coming in as a biased party in defense of whoever the defendant is, no matter what their crime is, whatever, or what their violation of law is. They're going to defend them if the, if the, the, uh, the plaintiff in the case is poor or disenfranchised in some way. They don't like them. So what do you do? Well, first thing, obviously, is we need to revisit the laws, the federal and the state law, the federal level in this case, because it it's a horrible law. The horrible, in 1986, with the 104th Congress, Republican-controlled Congress, conservative-leaning Supreme Court upholding these laws, yeah, it's it it's directly violates the federal constitution. The federal constitution prohibits this kind of thing. It, it just prohibits it. You can't do it. The, the Bill of Rights, First Amendment, forbids Congress to make laws of this nature. It forbids it. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting the petition, the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So how does the Congress have the power to do it? Why isn't the U.S. Supreme Court coming in and saying, sorry, it's a clear violation of, federal law, of the U.S. Constitution for you to make these laws? There's your question. This is what we have. And I'm not saying necessarily that, that if we had a liberal in court, we might have had a, a different reaction. We may not have. I mean, I honestly don't know. There's no way to go back in time and decide. The liberal court could have still upheld this law. Or could they simply have chosen not to hear the case, as is the case with 90-some-odd percent of cases submitted to the U.S. Supreme Court every year. But nevertheless, the fact is that a moderately, or a a uh, conservative-leaning court sided with a conservative-leaning Congress to uphold this law. So, what needs to be done? Well, the law needs to be changed, obviously. But the fact that the law is being abused and not being followed and adhered to by Montana also needs to be looked into. I mean, that, that's and that's where the core of this issue, and that's what brings the crux of this complaint. Not that this law exists, because... It exists, let's face it, it exists, it's a bad law. It does, it gives way too much power to federal courts to do exactly what they are doing. And that is to use it as a springboard to, to actually come in and litigate the cases against the plaintiffs who are filing. 
the courts are not supposed to litigate. The courts are supposed to arbitrate. Litigation is for the parties. If Jim, Bob, and I are in court, it's Jim, Bob, and I against each other, and the court listens to our arguments and makes a decision based on the law. Or if there's no presiding law, to make a decision to be the governing law of the land thereafter. That's what's called a precedent. But when you have a court that sits here and instead gets involved as a party and starts arguing against the plaintiff before the defendant is ever served, that's a problem. Yes, 1958 gives a narrow window in which the court can do exactly this. Come in, rule, and say, okay, this is what we are doing. This is the law. It's a frivolous claim to complain about not having chocolate cake at lunch. You had lemon cake, you're fine. Okay, that's what the law allows. It doesn't give the courts the authority to come in and actually make a legal case against the filant. Remember, I brought in an example, and, I, and I, I, I'll give a disclaimer. I'm making this case. I made that case up earlier. I'll make this, I'm making this case up now. I'm not actually quoting actual law here. But Cook versus Franchise, let's call it Cook versus Franchise, um, the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has decided that inmates don't, to, don't get to choose where their food comes from and cannot argue, cannot bring a claim to have Burger King served every day at lunch. Okay, obviously, like I said, made-up case, doesn't exist. But it could be a legal case. It could be a, I, mean, I, could, I could see a, a world in which a, a, an inmate said, I'm tired of the, of the slop we're getting. I want actual franchise food. I want McDonald's. I want Burger King. And we, need, we have a right to that. And sue the, the, the prison over it. I can see a world where that could happen. Because frivolous lawsuits do exist. But if and using that as an example, that particular if that particular case existed, it would have been litigated, it would have been decided against, and it would have been ruled against. And that's why you would have a precedent. That's why you would have a case. Because a case was allowed to go forward. It wasn't stopped at the at the beginning, reviewed by a federal judge who said, I think this case is bad, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why, and I'm gonna make a legal argument and defend the defendant in this case. The only thing 1915A would have allowed the court to do under that circumstance would have been decided that it was frivolous. And yeah, it's frivolous. Although, I could also, depending on how it was presented, I guess, I could also see the argument that substandard food in the prison system meant that they needed to provide something that was healthier, was more substantial, and perhaps not fast food. I mean, we all know there's a host of information about how unhealthy fast food is. But they could, they, they could use as a springboard an argument that they were entitled to healthier food. So the case could have had precedent. The case could have moved forward upon substantial and non-frivolous grounds. But, and I'm just arguing hypotheticals at this point, obviously, but the idea is that the federal court can't come in and use this case to say, to actually argue against someone complaining about chocolate cake at lunch. All we can say is, whether you have chocolate cake or lemon cake at lunch, it's a frivolous issue. It's not a violation of your civil rights. Therefore, we're not going to are not going to take up this case. Okay, fair enough. Maybe not fair, but fairer than how it's been applied, because the federal judges don't stop there. They do go in and argue on behalf of the on behalf of the actual defendants. They 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 argue against the plaintiff before ever hearing what the defendants defendants position is. Where the defendant doesn't even have to defend themselves. The court will defend you for them. They defend them for you. If, once again, Jim Bob, Jim Bob doesn't have to worry about coming to court at all because he's got a, a judge who will argue on his behalf and defend him before his claim ever has to get brought or his defense ever has to get brought. But the problem is, of course, as I mentioned, that Montana goes above and beyond this. It doesn't just stop with inmates who are bringing claim against government. It applies to anyone who files informal papyrus, who files as an indigent, as somebody who can't afford to, to pay the exorbitant fees that the courts charge to file actions. Therefore, they come in and they argue against and on behalf of the defendants of every single case that is brought by somebody who is poor. And the majority of cases simply get shot down because the court doesn't want to be burdened with it. You're poor, we don't care. So we're going to find reasons to deny your claim. If that's not bias and prejudice, I don't know what is, because that, that's so 
it's so above and beyond the idea. But that's the subject of today. Do we sit back and let the court censor the material that's put in? Is it a right? Does the court have that, have that authority? No, of course not. No law gives them that authority, but Montana takes it because Montana is broken. Once again, this is the Great Montana Conspiracy, not the Great Montana Legal System. Because if it was actually following the law, if it was actually doing what the, what the law provided, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be making this video. I would not have been arrested. I would not have been in prison. And I would not be presently under supervision and detention by the state of Montana. Because if the laws were followed, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be making these arguments. There would be no issue. And maybe there'd be an issue for arguing that 1915A is unconstitutional in its application to denial of millions of people of access to court. But we wouldn't be here arguing about the, the Montana courts acting against the law and repeatedly and frequently using a non-existent application of law to justify what they're doing. It's a conspiracy, it's a criminal conspiracy, and it's a criminal conspiracy because they are violating the law. But do you want anything about it? That's the question. And I'll leave that with you today. Once again, as always, the part of the video I don't like is talking about the fact that if you like this video, if you want the, if you want my message to continue, if you want my message to expand beyond the small little technical window I have access to, support us. Go to YouTube, subscribe to my channel, share my videos, get 10 people to follow my channel, get, t get their friends to, to follow my channel, just keep it up. Get me up to 1,000 subscribers so I can lock into the YouTube's automatic um, uh, promotion system. By all means, if you want to help us support us beyond that, you can always send us, send us uh, material. That's always important. Material, subject matter. If you, have, if you have an issue you want me to look into, I'd love to. If you have a personal story, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to go into the details. As I've mentioned before, I'm using a little iPhone 8, so you'll have to forgive that I don't really have the ability to conduct a lot of interviews in a proper text. I mean, I've tried to pull up a, a screen here and I get a little bitty window in the corner of who I'm talking to. I don't get the ability to split the screen. So I don't really have a way to do an effective interview. But if you want to do a voice interview or if you want to do a little screen interview and have your, have your image pop up there, we can try. I'm willing to give it a try. I'm willing to try anything to get information out there. But if you want that, by all means, contact me. As always, if you have a, uh, if you are an incarcerated individual, if you are any state supervision, I can't speak to you. It's not a choice. Well, it is a choice. I don't want to go back to prison for 15 years. So that is my choice. But it's a condition that's been imposed upon me as part of my detention, as part of my confinement, is that I cannot communicate with people who are incarcerated or who are under supervision. They don't want people to communicate. I mean, ironically enough, and here, here's the real irony of that one, because and I wanted to say this for a while, but they throw people in prison together where they talk all the time, every day, hours and hours a day. But once they're out of prison, don't don't talk to each other unless we, unless we give you permission. We want to know if you're talking to each other. Or, worse yet, you can't talk to anybody you... If you spent the last five years in, in prison, you got a really good friend, you, you, you've you made really close ties with people and you want to keep in contact, you can't. You can't because you can't communicate with them now, now that you're out. They don't want a civil-based, organized resistance. They don't want people coming together and sharing information out here on where I'm doing right now. I'm one voice. But I can't communicate with others who, who are similarly situated. I can't communicate with people who are on probation or communicate with people who are in prison. I can't help them recognize whether they have an issue to raise or claim. Not offering legal advice. I, and I, I emphasize that. I'm not suggesting being counsel or lawyer for anybody. But I can at least tell them if they've if what the what the law is. Like I'm doing here. I told you guys all about 42 USC section 1983. I told you all about RICO. I'm not sitting here and telling you this is your claim and this is what you need to do and this is da, da 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 but I am telling you about the law so you can be informed. And I have a right to communicate that people who are similarly situated except not in Montana. In Montana, I can't. So if you are incarcerated or under supervision, 
please contact my producer, Bill Russell. His information should be attached to this video. If not, by all means, please go to monspiracy.podbean.com, which is where this, this uh, podcast originates, and look at my information there so you can contact Bill. Obviously, any material donations, if you have recording equipment, if you have a better video audio connection, if you have better editing software that you want to donate so I can put on a, a better production of this information so we can do the split screen so we can have so give me materials so I can set up a studio where I actually sit down across the table from somebody. I love it. I can't afford it, which is why I have to ask for support. You can also donate money. And of course, you can use ron underscore glick69 at yahoo.com to send any PayPal donations if you wish to do so. Um, if you want to do a more material-related donation, you can always buy my books. I have 24 publications, one of which is U.S. Political Prisoners Since 2004, which is my biography, and has a ton of scanned documents and information in there that you can look at and determine for yourself based upon the actual physical evidence of my situation and case. Or if you want to buy any of my other books that have uh, nothing to do with this, but you want the proceeds to go to this, send me, a, send me an email. Send me a message and say, hey, um, I'm buying Wizard in Wonderland, but I want the profits of this book to go to fund your, your podcast. By all means, yeah, sure, no problem. Absolutely no problem. I'll gladly divert that buck and a half or buck and a quarter or whatever I get for selling that book to this, pro this project. As I mentioned before, I don't make a lot of money at my books. If I make 20 bucks a month, that's a good month. I don't, I don't do a lot of sales. I keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, but I don't make a lot of sales at my books. So it's not like I'm taking and diverting money away and saying, oh, you know, that's, that's going to cost me my rent this month. Not at all. I don't earn enough to, to squabble over whether I'm diverting the money between making more copies to give away to try to pr promote awareness of my books or whether I'm using it to support this podcast. So it's not going to affect me one way or the other. If you want your, your contribution in the form of a purchase and you want the proceeds to go to this program, ask and I, shall, and I will make your wish come true. <laughs> if that's at all conceivably possible. Okay, I think that wraps up. As always, um, please be safe out there, and if at all possible, stay free. Thank you. <laughs>